Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished judges, friends of the faculty, colleagues, students. Um, I had someone ask me as we walked in, could we not have the lecture outside? <laughs> it is really that sort of weather, so uh, it's very good to see you here this evening inside rather than making the most of it. Uh, I'm Sarah Worthington, for those who don't know me, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the law faculty for this fifth uh, Cambridge Freshfields Annual Law Lecture. Mm -hmm. This is a series of lectures generously sponsored by Freshfields and organised by the Cambridge Private Law Centre. And it's one of our ambitions as the centre to facilitate more informed and lively debate about some of the fundamental and significant legal issues we face. So we're especially delighted this evening to have Professor Stephen Smith uh, here to speak. He is eminently qualified to deliver exactly what we want. I know in an introduction I should tell you something you don't already know about the speaker, but I'll start with the well-known. Uh, Steve Smith is the James McGill Professor in the Faculty of Law at McGill University. His academic career began with a BA in Political Science in Canada, followed by an LLB at the University of Toronto. He did well enough in that to then work as a clerk to the Chief, then Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, the Right Honourable Brian Dixon. Then he looked overseas, and somehow, rather inexplicably, he ended up at that other place, uh, undertaking his DPhil in Oxford and staying on as a tutor and senior fellow at St Anne's. However, if you examine his CV, there were enough visiting appointments and lectures overseas uh, during that stint in Oxford to enable a fortune teller to predict an eventual move to his current home, the University of McGill, in 1998. Since then, and from that base at McGill, Steve seems to have ventured all over the globe. I know academics have a reputation for being able to get around, and Europe and Asia are perhaps predictable destinations, but if you look at Steve Smith's CV, it reveals some very serious writing on Russian and Chinese contract law. Uh, I haven't read those. Uh, his books and writings have earned him various academic awards, and I won't, I won't go through them all. My very first introduction to Steve Smith came when I encountered his book Contract Theory in the Clarendon Law Series. Quite a special book. But there's another earlier book, introducing common law concepts, one that's no doubt sharpened by his role at McGill that has him teaching both civil law and common law, which he's done for an extended period of time. The very particular insights that that sort of exposure and focus must inevitably produce have no doubt influenced his take in his forthcoming book, rather enticingly entitled rights, wrongs and injustices, the structure of remedial law. In this book, Steve seeks to explain remedial law in terms of general principles, not historical categories, something we're not so used to. And it's a rich hinterland, so I'm sure that this evening we're about to have some of the product of that thinking revealed in tonight's lecture, rights, wrongs and injustices, taking remedies seriously. The plan is that Steve will speak for about 50 minutes, 45 minutes, 50 minutes, and then we'll have questions, and then we'll go upstairs to the ground floor for drinks. Everybody here is warmly welcomed uh, to those drinks, but without more ado, I welcome you, Steve. Thank you, Sarah, for those kind words, and thank you to Freshfields for sponsoring this. When I was in university, I had a summer job as a uh, tour guide, a, a bicycle tours. And we used to say that the secret of a good tour was expectation management. And I used to um, tell the novice guides, I said, when you're explaining the day's route, you make it sound as bad as you can. If you made it sound one bit worse, they wouldn't do it. And then at the end of the day, they will be really happy. And because it will turn out so much better than they expected. Now, on that ground, I don't think Sarah did a very good job. She sort of suggested this is all going to be downhill cycling, but I promise you there's going to be a few bumps and even a few uh, long uphills um, in this lecture. 
So the law imposes itself on citizens, I think, in three main ways. The first is by enacting or recognizing substantive rules. For example, there are rules that stipulate general legal duties. Everyone has a duty to perform their contracts. And there are rules that tell individuals what they must do if they wish to create or modify such duties. A contract is created by an offer and an acceptance. The second way the law imposes itself is by courts issuing rulings. Typically, these rulings direct individuals to do or not to do specific things. For example, a court might order a defendant to pay the claimant a sum of money or to return the claimant's property. The third and final way that the law imposes itself on citizens is by imposing sanctions. So, for example, legal officials might throw citizens in jail or seize their property. The first and the third of these methods, enacting rules and imposing sanctions, have been studied extensively by legal scholars. Most general theories of law are theories about rules or sanctions or some combination of the two. But the second method, issuing rulings, has been largely ignored. Now, as I hope to show in this lecture, there's a lot of law that deals with rulings. And this is law that students study here and that's applied every day in the courts. But we have not asked the big questions about it that we've asked about other areas of the law. And in my talk today, I want to raise some of these questions. I will also try to answer them, but what I'm really interested in are the questions. Whether or not you agree with my answers, I hope to convince you that the questions are important. Now, you've noticed that this talk is entitled Taking Remedies Seriously, Not Taking Rulings Seriously, so I should explain that. It's because I'm focusing on a particular category of rulings, which I call remedial rulings, or just remedies. Some of what I say today applies to rulings generally, but most of the talk focuses on remedial rulings, and in particular, private law <laughs> remedial rulings. And I'll address two broad questions. First, what is a remedy? And second, when are remedies available? On what grounds do courts grant remedies? But before I turn to these questions, it might help to set the scene if I say a few words about how I came to be asking them. Now, the short answer is that, as Sarah said, I'm writing a book on re remedies. The longer answer is that my interest in these questions originated with two puzzles. The first puzzle was pedagogical. A few years ago, I was asked to teach a course on private law remedies. So I put together a list of materials based on the kind of standard textbooks. And when it came time to prepare my lectures, I did what I usually do. I tried to find a common thread or principle or question to tie the materials together. And initially, I failed. A large part of the course focused on specific relief. These rules seemed to be concerned exclusively with the question of when courts would issue specific relief. The remainder of the course was mostly about damages. These rules seemed concerned not with the availability of damage awards, but with their content. It wasn't obvious to me what these rules had in common. Never mind what rules on things like self-help or rescission, which are also discussed in most remedies textbooks, had in common with the rules on either specific relief or damages. Now, it's true that all these rules are remedial in the sense that they're all a cure of some sort for a problem of some kind or another. But the same is true of contract law or tort law and indeed of law generally. Right? Law is a remedy for the problems that exist in a world without law. So I was puzzled by the course that I was teaching. Eventually, however, reflection on this puzzle led me to think that there was something distinctive about at least some of the rules that I was teaching. In particular, it seemed to me, and it still seems to me, that the rules governing specific relief were different from most of the rules that I was teaching in my other substantive law classes. The rules on specific relief are fundamentally rules for courts. They tell courts how to act. Stated differently, they're arguably public law rules. Their concern is the action of state officials. Now, of course, all legal rules are applied by courts. 
But the rules governing specific relief aren't just applied by courts, they're telling courts how they should act. In particular, they tell courts what they should do when individuals come to them seeking assistance. For example, they tell courts they should not grant requests for specific performance if damages would be adequate. In contrast, the rules that make up substantive law, for example, the core rules of contract and tort law, are different. These rules are addressed to citizens. They tell citizens how they should behave towards one another. They say things like, fulfill your contractual promises, do not trespass, do not take others' property, and so on. This distinction seemed to me, and still seems to me, important. It's important because the question of how citizens should treat one another is different from the question of what courts should do when citizens come to them for assistance. Different considerations apply. So let me give a non-legal example to illustrate the point. So a few years ago, when my children were still living at home, my younger son came up to me one evening fuming mad. He was mad at his older brother because his brother had promised to help him with his homework but was now refusing to do so. He wanted me to do something about it. So I called in my older son and I interrogated him. I live in Quebec, it's a civil law jurisdiction, I can do that. And I determined that the promise had been made. Indeed, my older son admitted as much. What had happened was that they subsequently fell into a disagreement about an unrelated matter. So what did I do? Well, my younger son wanted a specific performance remedy. He wanted me to order his older brother to help him with the homework. But I refused. Why? Well, I didn't refuse because I thought my older son had a good excuse. I thought he should help my younger son with the homework. The law in our family is that promises are meant to be kept. I refused because if I ordered specific performance, then as any parent here knows, the two of them would have been back before me arguing again within about 10 minutes. So I decided on an alternative remedy. It wasn't damages, our family's not quite that legalistic, but it was an attempt to find a substitute as best I could. I think I ordered, ordered my older son to do some of the younger son's chores, do the dishes or something, so he'd have extra time to do his homework. Now, this is a very simple example, but it illustrates, I think, the distinction between substantive and remedial law. The reason that I refused specific performance had nothing to do with whether or not my son should keep his promise. As I said, the substantive law in our family is that promises should be kept. I refused for remedial law reasons, reasons that applied uniquely to me, the court. So reflection on this distinction led me to conclude that the most useful definition of a remedy is that it's a judicial ruling. A private law remedy is a ruling that's intended to resolve a private law dispute. So remedial law, in this view, it's the law that governs the availability and the content of such rulings. But this definition led me to what was the real pedagogical puzzle. Which rules belong in this category? Which private law rules are rules for courts and which are rules for citizens? In particular, where do the rules on damages and the rules on restitution fit in this scheme? Are they directed fundamentally at citizens or at courts? The answer is not obvious. Indeed, the question seems barely to have been asked. Courts and commentators refer constantly to liabilities to pay damages or to make restitution, but it's rarely clear whether they mean liabilities to fall under substantive duties to pay damages or liabilities merely to being ordered by a court to pay damages or whether the answer makes a difference. More generally, Books on remedies rarely ask what, if anything, distinguishes the rules that they discuss from the rules that are taught in substantive law courses. And of course, most of the rules taught in remedies courses are actually also taught in substantive law courses. So the first puzzle then was to determine the content of remedial law. Well, the second puzzle was philosophical. So when I started teaching remedies, I also taught jurisprudence. Not surprisingly, I became interested in what the jurisprudential literature had to say about judicial rulings. And what I found was that it had very little to say. Indeed, the question of why courts issue rulings at all, and in particular, why they issue rulings that direct defendants to do things, has barely been raised. 
And again, the answer isn't obvious. Why bother telling defendants to do things? For example, pay the claimant 100 pounds when the law has or could have substantive rules that say the same thing and sanctions that it can apply when the rules aren't following, aren't followed. The ruling seems to do nothing more than just repeat the rule. So reflection on this puzzle led me to think that we lack a satisfactory account of the nature and role of legal rulings. Further, as I thought about the ways in which rulings differ from rules and sanctions, I became convinced that understanding these differences was critical to understanding why courts make the particular kinds of rulings they make. So in short, these two projects, understanding private law remedies and understanding rulings, came together. And the book that I'm writing is the outcome of that merger. It's not a treatise. It's fundamentally an argument for taking its subject matter seriously, for asking serious, question what, serious questions about what courts are doing when they issue rulings. Now, the argument in the book has two prongs. The first prong, which is my focus today, is the response to the pedagogical puzzle. And it seeks to establish the scope and the structure of remedial law, in particular, private law, remedial law. But the other prong of the argument is a response to the jurisprudential puzzle. The core idea here is that rulings, and in particular rulings that require defendants to do things, provide distinctive reasons for action, reasons different from those provided by rules or sanctions. Now, I can't explore this philosophical argument in detail today, but it does underpin a lot of what I'm going to say, so I thought it might be useful if I gave you a couple of examples, again, they're non-legal examples, that I think illustrate some of the differences between rules, orders, and sanctions. So in my household, my wife and I imply each of the methods that the law implies. We use rules, we use orders, and we use sanctions. So for example, we have a rule in the family that you must not throw food at the dinner table. That rule's broken, my usual response is to issue an order. Stop throwing food. And if that does not work, my next usual response, at least when my children were younger, was a sanction. For example, sending the offender to his or her room. So the question is, what's the point of the order? It appears to just repeat the rule. Why bother? Now, it's sometimes suggested that an order is a reminder or clarification of the rule. But that seems implausible. The rule is clear, well known, and the order is expressed as an order, not a clarification or a declaration. It's also sometimes suggested that the rule is a warning or a threat of a sanction. But this seems implausible. An order is not expressed as a warning. It says nothing about the possible sanction. And in many cases, orders are given even where there's no possibility of sanctions. I still occasionally issue orders to my older son even though he's now six foot five inches tall and there is no chance that I am going to sanction him. So why do I issue orders? Well, the reason I suggest is that I want to invoke a distinctive kind of authority, a kind of authority that's different from that on which I rely when I enact rules. Rules like don't throw food at the table are basically statements that a duty exists. Everyone has a duty not to throw food. In contrast, an order is a command, stop throwing food. When I announce a rule, my hope is that my children will accept that what it says is true, namely that they have the duty that the rule declares. But when I issue an order, I'm asking for obedience. The authority to declare duties and the authority to command obedience are different. And this difference is reflected in ordinary practices. So if my son questions the no throwing food rule. I'll probably respond by trying to explain why the rule expresses a valid duty. So I might explain that throwing food is wasteful or can lead to injuries or will inhib inhibit morally uplifting dinner table conversation. I might also respond that by virtue of my age and experience, I'm an authority on duties. I'd offer these explanations in the hope that my son will accept that the rule actually does what it purports to do, namely to state a valid duty. But if my son continues to disagree and to refuse to comply, 
Then I'll switch, usually, to the different kind of authority embodied in orders. Stop throwing food. And when I do this, I'm invoking my presumed right to be obeyed, regardless of the merits of the ordered action. And like many of us, I often make this switch between these two kinds of authority quite explicit. Tell me if you've ever done this if you're a parent. I often say, I don't care what you think. Just stop it. So the lesson of this story is that there are often good reasons to issue orders, even where they merely replicate the content of a rule. We can also tweak this story a bit to illustrate that in some circumstances, we might want to use an order not just to support a rule, but instead of a rule. So when my children were younger, if they threw food at the table, even after I'd ordered them not to, as I said, usually a sanction would follow. In our family, the sanction was usually being sent to their room. No doubt that's considered bad parenting today, but that's not my focus. My focus is how was this sanction, the punishment, communicated? Now, one possibility would be to enact a rule to the effect that anyone who throws food has a duty to immediately go to their room. Our household never had a rule like that, nor do any legal systems that I know of. You never see rules that impose duties on wrongdoers to perform actions which are intended as punishments. What you find instead is that punishments are imposed by judicial rulings. If my son was throwing food, I'd order him to his room. And when citizens commit crimes, it's courts or their delegates that order them to pay fines, go to prison, and so on. So why don't we use rules to impose punishments? Why don't we have substantive duties, substantive rules that say things like, anyone who parks in a handicapped zone has a duty to pay 300 pounds to the state immediately. We don't have those rules. Why not? Well, it's true that not many offenders would actually comply with them. But some would, and in any event, if wrongdoers should pay fines, you'd think we'd have legal rules that say this, but we don't. We just make orders. Why? Well, the reason I suggest is that we don't think wrongdoers have duties to punish themselves. Whatever justification exists for punishment, whether retribution, deter deterrence, whatever, it's a justification not for wrongdoers punishing themselves, but for the state imposing punishment on wrongdoers. Indeed, if we had legislation that imposed a duty to pay 300 pounds if you park in a handicapped zone, it would be self-defeating. The rule would be interpreted as imposing a tax or a fee on parking in handicapped zones, rather than a fine. This interpretation would be adopted because it's the only way to make sense of the idea that this rule is, imposing, is declaring a duty. A duty to self-punish is unintelligible, but a duty to pay a tax or a fee is intelligible. Now, these comments only scrape the surface of a very complex issue, but I hope they're sufficient to get you to entertain the idea that there's something distinctive about orders, and in particular, that we might want to use orders not just to substan support substantive rules, but also, in some cases, as alternatives to substantive rules. So, let me return finally to the questions I mentioned at the beginning. What is a remedy, and on what grounds, or when do courts issue remedies? So, what is a remedy? Well, I should be clear by now, my answer to this is that a remedy is a judicial ruling, and a private law remedy is a ruling that's intended to resolve a private law dispute. In the remainder of this talk, I will focus on one type or category of private law ruling, a ruling that requires the defendant to do or not to do something. And I call these directive rulings, or just orders. Right? And the main examples are specific performance, injunctions, order to pay damages, orders to pay a debt, and orders for the recovery of land or other property. These are the most common type of private law rulings, and understanding them is critical for understanding not just remedial law, but also substantive private law. What are the practical implications of, that de of this definition? Well, first, it excludes from remedial law rules that are often discussed in remedies textbooks. So, for example, rules relating to things like self-help or stipulated damages clauses aren't, on this definition, part of remedial law. 
They're part of substantive law. A stipulated damages clause is just a term in a contract. The second implication is that some things that are not discussed in typical remedies texts are part of remedial law. In particular, a significant amount of the law governing private law defenses is remedial. Many private law defenses are not reasons for individuals to act differently. They're merely reasons for courts not to issue rulings. So, for example, limitation periods typically leave substantive duties unchanged. They merely preclude courts from giving remedies. The same is true, I argue, for many formalities, immunities, res judicata, settlement, abuse of process, and parts of the law of illegality. The third implication is that most of the rules discussed in typical rem remedies textbooks turn out, actually, to belong there. In other words, I eventually came to the view that there was something in common between most of the rules that I was teaching in my remedies course. So to begin, the rules governing specific relief, as I already indicated, are remedial. These rules tell courts when they should award specific relief. And the same is true of the rules governing orders to pay debts and orders for the recovery of land or property. There aren't many such rules, but what there are are directed at courts. Most importantly, the law of damages and the law of restitution are, in my view, part of remedial law. Now, this classification is actually very controversial because many writers believe that wrongdoers have substantive duties to pay damages, duties that arise at the moment of the wrong. Many writers also believe that individuals who've been unjustly enriched have substantive duties to reverse the enrichment, to make restitution from the moment that they were enriched. And if that view is correct, then the law of damages and the law of restitution are part of substantive law. They tell individuals what they should do if they've committed wrongs or if they've been unjustly enriched. And in this view, an order to pay damages or to make restitution is just like an order to pay a debt. It merely tells the defendant to do what he or she should have done already. Understood in this way, the only remedial law in these cases is the rule that if you refuse to comply with a substantive duty to pay a sum of money, the courts will order you to pay the sum. I once held this view myself of damages and restitution. I'm happy to discuss later why I've come to reject it, but for the moment I'm just going to mention two reasons. The first is about damages. So in the common law, it's clear law, and has been clear law for probably over 700 years, that it's no defense to a claim for damages that you offered to pay the amount that the claimant is seeking. Suppose I carelessly break your window. And suppose I offer to uh, give you 100 pounds, which is what it will cost to fix the window. And you're not you know, like me or whatever, you're angry with me. You refuse, and you sue me instead, asking for 100 pounds in damages. In my defense, I argued that I offered to pay you the money. My defense will be rejected. It's not a valid defense in the common law. But if there were a duty to pay de damages, this rule makes no sense. Your refusal to accept the money would clearly be a defense. Indeed, even if I pay you the money, say I just send it to you in the mail, then unless that part of payment is part of a settlement, you will still win. You'll still get judgment for 100 pounds. Now, it's true, I might get my money back through a set-off and unjust enrichment, but you will win the claim for damages. As for restitution, if there were a duty to make restitution following an unjust enrichment, for example, if the recipient of a mistaken payment were under a duty from the moment of the receipt to return the money, then the failure to comply with this duty should be a wrong and should support a claim for damages, but it doesn't. Just as there are no damages for failing to pay damages, there are no damages for failing to make restitution. So for these and other reasons, the law of damages and the law of restitution is, in my view, remedial law. It tells courts, not citizens, what to do when faced with proof of a wrong or an unjust enrichment. So why does it matter how we classify? Who cares whether these things are remedial or substantive? Well, it matters for various reasons, but the main one is that the distinction is critical if we're trying to understand why we have these rules. If there's no duty to pay damages prior to an order, why not? Might it be 
And this is in fact partly my view, that damages, or at least certain kinds of damages, have more in common with punishment than we normally think. If damages are something that courts impose on wrongdoers, then just as in the case of punishment, it becomes much more plausible to think that they are intended, at least in part, to send a message to the parties. I turn now to the second question. When do we get remedies? On what grounds do we get remedies? This question has attracted little attention in the common law. A few scholars, notably Blackstone, have suggested that all remedies are remedies for wrongs. Others, Peter Burks, for example, have suggested that all remedies are responses to proof of a substantive right. In my view, as the title of my talk suggests, the answer is more complex. In my view, there are three basic causes of action in the common law, by which I mean three factual situations that, if proven by a claimant, will normally lead to a re remedy. And I describe these as rights threats, wrongs, and injustices. So now we're going to get some slide, which means this is the harder part. This is, but now we're going to be going uphill. You have to pay even a little bit more attention. Now, I can't possibly defend this claim properly in a single lecture. So instead, I'm going to do four things. First, I'll briefly explain the meaning of each of these categories. Second, I'll provide a single example, illustrative example, of each category. Third, I'll say a few words about why courts issue orders in, each, in response to these events. Fourth, finally, after setting out the categories, I'll explain where I think the remedies that I haven't yet talked about, everything else, fits within the scheme. So the first and most basic cause of action is a rights threat. Now, rights threat arises where the claimant's substantive rights are under threat because the defendant's unwilling to comply with those rights. And where a rights threat is proven, the courts typically respond by ordering the defendant to comply with the right. In other words, the typical response replicates the content of the defendant's substantive duty. It's what I call a replicative remedy. So, an example. Suppose that you and I have made a contract, and as part of that contract, you've agreed to a non-competition covenant. And let's suppose you're breaching the covenant. You're competing with me. Now, your ongoing breach is a rights threat. It's clear evidence that you're unwilling to respect my contractual rights. And on proof of this unwillingness, a court will normally order you to comply with the covenant. Now, I describe the cause of action for this ruling as a rights threat, not merely a right, because the threat is the reason for the ruling. A court will not order you to comply with my contractual right merely because the right exists. I need to show that you're unwilling to comply with it. A rights threat is also different from a wrong. Now, in my example, you have committed a wrong by breaching the covenant. But the relevance of the wrong, at least so far as the order to comply is concerned, it's simply evidence of the threat. It's evidence of your unwillingness to comply with your duty. This is why it's not necessary to prove a wrong to demonstrate a rights threat. So, for example, if I can show that although you haven't yet breached the covenant, you're intending to breach it in the near future, then I can normally obtain an injunction, the so-called quia timet injunction, directing you to comply with the covenant. It's also possible to commit a wrong without threatening a right. So, for example, if you accidentally committed a one-off breach of our covenant, a court would normally refuse to order you to comply with the covenant. They would refuse because while you have infringed my rights, my rights aren't under threat for the future. So why do courts issue orders in response to rights threats? Well, this is the same question that I raised earlier when I gave the example from my household of an order to stop throwing food. That order was a response to a rights threat. It was a rights threat responding order. And the reason for issuing such orders, as I explained, or at least as I illustrated, is to provide a new and different reason to do what the substantive law requires. Right? When courts issue orders, they're relying on a different kind of authority from that which they use 
when the law enacts substantive rules. They're relying on their authority to command obedience. So there's nothing surprising, then, about an order that's directing unwilling defendants to do what they already had substantive duties to do. Sorry, that one was supposed to go up just before to explain what I'm going to do, and now we're starting to do it. Okay. So the second private law cause of action is a wrong. And by wrong, I just mean a breach of a substantive duty, such as a breach of contract or a tort. Now, you might expect that my example here would be an award of damages. But as I'll explain in a moment, in my view, only some damages are responses to wrongs. So my example is going to be narrower. It's an award of nominal damages. Now, of course, nominal damages are relatively uncommon. However, they are, I think, a clear example within what is, in general, a difficult category. So why are they a clear example of a wrong responding order? Two reasons. First, and most obviously, the only thing you have to prove to obtain nominal damages is that a wrong occurred. If a trespass is proven, you can get nominal damages. You don't have to show anything else. Second, the sums awarded as nominal damages are, at the end of the day, arbitrary. Could be one pound, could be 10 pounds. This arbitrariness is, in my view, exactly what we should expect if these awards are responses to wrongs. Now, when an order is given in response to a rights threat, or, as I'll explain in a moment, in response to an injustice, the appropriate judicial response is pretty obvious. The court should order the defendant to respect the threatened right or to reverse the injustice. But there's no logical response to a wrong. Just as there are many forms of punishment that could, in principle, achieve the aims that we currently pursue by fines and incarceration, there are many forms of private redress that could, in principle, provide a private law response to wrongs. <coughs> as Peter Burks once remarked, the courts would not be acting inconsistently if their response to private wrongs was to order the wrongdoer's ears to be cut off. It might be inhumane, disproportionate, but it wouldn't be inconsistent. In short, nominal damages are symbolic. And what they're meant to symbolize is that the defendant wronged the plaintiff. Why do the courts, third question, why do the courts issue such orders? Well, the question here is, isn't really why do they issue them. The question is, why aren't there substantive rules that require wrongdoers to do the things that such orders require? Why don't wrongdoers have substantive duties to pay their victims one pound immediately following their wrongdoing. If such a duty existed, then the cause of action for an order of nominal damages would be a rights threat. It would be a rights threat because the only time courts would need to issue such orders is when wrongdoers fail to comply with their substantive duty to pay nominal damages. I think it's clear as a matter of positive law that no such duty exists, but why not? Why leave it to the courts to order payment of nominal damages? It's a difficult question. Briefly, however, the explanation, in my view, is that when the law responds to wrongs, what it's doing fundamentally is communicating a message. It's saying that the defendant wronged the claim claimant. And for that message to be communicated, it has to be issued by a court. I mentioned earlier that criminal wrongdoers never have substantive duties to punish themselves. For punishment to be punishment, it has to be imposed by an order. Well, the same is true, I suggest, for the private law's response to wrongs. For damages to be a response to a wrong, they have to be imposed by a court. The third and final cause of action in the common law is an injustice. Now, the term injustice, I know, is often used in a very broad sense, so broad that it would capture any possible cause of action you could imagine. But I think when the term is used in its core sense, it does not encompass rights, threats, or wrongs. Committing a battery, lying, stealing, robbing, breaking, pro these are wrongs. We don't typically call them injustices. The label unjust is basically the legal version of unfair. And it's properly applied only to actions that are allocating something. So that's why we ask whether the tax system is just and whether, why we ask whether a particular measure of punishment is just. 
I'm not suggesting, of course, that courts provide remedies for every kind of injustice. As with the concept of a wrong, the law has a tightly circumscribed notion of what counts legally as an injustice. Indeed, the range of injustices recognized by private law is much narrower than the range of wrongs that it recognizes. The example that I'm going to use to illustrate this category is, again, a little bit unusual. But even more than the category of wrongs, the category of, in of injustices is controversial. So the example is legislative in origin. Most <coughs> common law jurisdictions have legislation that authorizes courts to issue orders dealing with maintenance and division of matrimonial property following the breakdown of a marriage. So in England, the relevant legislation provides that courts may make an order that, quote, either party to the marriage shall pay to the other such lump sum or sums as may be so specified. Now, there's no suggestion in the legislation that the defendant must have had a substantive duty prior to the order to do what the order requires. The claimant merely needs to show that the allocation of the party's assets following the breakdown is, broadly speaking, unfair. So the cause of action for such orders is appropriately described as an injustice in the, as I've defined it. Courts issue these orders not because the defendant acted badly or threatened to act badly, but because the court thinks that the party's assets are allocated unfairly, that is to say, unjustly. Why do courts issue injustice responding orders? Again, a difficult question. And as with wrong responding orders, the real question isn't um, why do courts issue them, but why don't we have substantive rules that require defendants to do what these orders require them to do? So why don't the subjects of matrimonial property orders have substantive duties to do what these orders require? Now, my example of matrimonial property orders suggests that one possible answer is that it's too difficult to draw up a rule that could effectively guide citizens. Any substantive rule in this case would be impossibly complex. But if this were the only reason that the law refused to enact such rules, we would expect courts to respond by issuing declarations, not orders. As I mentioned earlier, duty-imposing rules are basically declarations of the existence of general duties. So the individualized counterpart to a rule is a declaration, not an order. But the matrimonial property orders are orders. They're not declarations. Why? Well, again, as I said, a difficult question. The answer, in my view, is that correcting injustices is not an appropriate subject matter for a substantive duty. Our substantive duties are basically duties not to wrong others. Correcting injustices is a valuable thing to do, but failing to correct an injustice is not a wrong. So go back to my household, as my earlier example suggested, my household I'm generally the dispenser of justice, right? But there are plenty of occasions when justices go uncorrected because I'm away or I'm asleep or I just think it's more important tonight to prepare a nice meal than to make sure that justice is done between my sons, right? I don't think there's anything wrong, at least in principle, in allowing, in do, making these decisions and allowing some justices, injustices to go uncorrected. Nor, by the way, do we as a society think this is wrong. If, provi if providing justice were the only thing that mattered, we would shut down all the schools and hospitals and put all that money into building more courts. But we don't. We don't because while correcting injustices is valuable, failing to do so isn't a wrong, or at least not a wrong in the sense that stealing or lying or breaking promises is wrong. So when the law wants individuals to correct injustices, it uses orders rather than rules to do this. Now, of course, an order, once it's issued, gives the defendant a duty to do what it says. Like wrong responding orders, injustice responding orders are creative orders. They create, at the moment they're issued, new duties. But the duty they create is a duty to obey the order. Unlike rules, 
As I said, orders are not declarations about the existence of duties. The only duty contemplated by an order is a duty to obey the court. So let me recap. So I've suggested that there's three basic causes of action in the common law. And I've given you a single, sometimes quite narrow example in each category. And I've said a few words, admittedly far too few, to probably convince you about why courts issue awards in each of these categories. The final question is, what about all the other remedies that I haven't talked about? So let me try to say a few words about that. I'm going to start with the easier cases. So there's a number of familiar remedies for which I think it's fairly clear that the cause of action is a rights threat. And the remedies I'm referring to here are orders to pay a debt, orders for the recovery of land or chattels, specific performance, and injunctions. Now there's a wrinkle or two that requires explaining in each case, which is why I didn't use any of these as my example. But in each case, the order directs the defendant to comply with a substantive duty. And in each case, what the claimant must show to obtain the order is that the, defend is that the defendant is not complying with the duty or is about to not comply. In other words, that the claimant's rights are under threat. Now to the harder cases. Restitution. The cause of action for orders to make restitution, or at least the core cases of orders to make restitution for impaired transfers. For example, an order to return money paid by mistake. These orders, I believe, fall into my third category, injustices. These orders are analogous in broad outline to the matrimonial property orders. Like the matrimonial orders, there's no substantive duty to do what the order requires. Failing to pay restitution is not a wrong. And as in the matrimonial property cases, what the courts are responding to when they order restitution is an unfair, or I would say an unjust, allocation of property. The court's order is intended to correct the injustice, which it does by reversing the transfer. Finally, damages. Damages are complicated. Part of the reason they're complicated is that there are different kinds of damages awards. Specifically, there appear to be at least three kinds of damage awards or parts of awards. These different kinds line up conveniently with the three causes of action that I've identified. So the first category is what I call substitutionary damages. And substitutionary damages are substitutes for specific relief. Now imagine that you're in breach of a contractual duty to build me a house. And suppose that our contract hasn't been terminated so that the duty is still binding. Now on these facts, my contractual rights are under threat because you're unwilling to comply with your substantive duty. Prima facie, the appropriate judicial response should be an order for you to build me the house. But for essentially practical and administrative reasons, as you know, the courts are unlikely to make such an order. Instead, they'll order you to pay me a monetary substitute for performance, typically a sum equal to the cost of hiring someone else to build the house. This order is a substitute for specific performance, and its cause of action, accordingly, is the same as specific performance. It's a rights threat. The second category of damages is consequential damages. These are awards, or parts of awards, that compensate for the losses caused by the defendant's actions. Now at one time, I thought such awards were similar to nominal damages, responses to wrongs. But I've changed my mind for three reasons. First, and most obviously, it's not sufficient to obtain such an award to show that you were wrong. You must also show that as a consequence of the defendant's action, you suffered a loss. Second, the sums of damages awarded under this heading often bear no relation to the seriousness of the wrong. Trivial wrongdoing can lead to massive awards and vice versa. Third, courts make these awards in cases where they believe the defendant acted perfectly reasonably. In other words, 
in cases where there does not appear to have been a wrong in any ordinary sense of the word. So a famous example is the American case of Vincent versus Lake Erie. So in Vincent, the defendant tied his ship without permission to the plaintiff's dock. He did it because there was a violent storm which was going to destroy the ship if it wasn't tied up. The ship caused minor damage to the dock, and the dock owner sued. The court said that the defendant had acted perfectly reasonably in what he did. However, they ordered him to pay for the damage that he caused to the dock. Now, Vincent's often regarded as an anomaly, but I think cases like Vincent are very common. Any case where courts award damages instead of specific relief, and where they do this because the cost of complying with the substantive duty is out of proportion to its value, has the same structure as Vincent. Miller versus Jackson has the same structure. So these cases, in my view, are critical for understanding consequential damages awards, because what they demonstrate is that consequential damages are in broad outline similar to the restitutionary awards that I discussed a moment ago. The fundamental question addressed by consequential damage awards is how the law should respond to losses that one person inflicts on another. And that's a question of fairness, or more strictly, justice. Now, of course, courts contemplating consequential damages, they don't just ask whether it's fair or just to make the defendant liable. As in the parallel case of unfair enrichments, the law has complex tests for determining what counts as an unfair loss. Indeed, in my view, the rules governing liability for another's losses can be viewed as the flip side of the rules governing liability for one's own gains. In each case, the relevant loss or gain might be a consequence of a wrongful act. But in each case, the law's concern is not fundamentally the wrongfulness of the defendant's behavior. It's the fairness of the loss or gain. The third and final category of damage awards is comprised of awards that are neither substitutionary nor loss-based. They're sometimes called vindicatory damages. So what damage awards fit into this category? Well, the most obvious example, which I've already discussed, is nominal damages. Nominal damages vindicate the claimant's rights by making clear that a wrong has occurred. A second relatively obvious example is punitive damages. Like nominal damages, punitive damages are the court's way of saying that a wrong has occurred. The difference is that punitive damages indicate that the wrongdoing was particularly egregious. Finally, I would also include within this category a variety of what I call market price damages awards. These are awards that are fixed at the market price or market rental rate of property or services, even where that sum exceeds the loss suffered by the defendant. For example, if you graze your cows on my field without permission. I can get an order that you pay me the rental rate for the field. And I can get this even if I would have never rented the fields to you or anyone else, and even if the grazing caused me no harm. So punitive damages and market price damages are similar to nominal damages. Their response is simply to the defendant's wrongdoings. Their attempts to represent in monetary form that the defendant wronged the plaintiff. Okay. So let me conclude with a bit of history. And I'm scared doing this, but looking at David, if it's in there, but I will do it nonetheless. For most of the common law's history, Private law was basically remedial law. It was rules about when you can get into court and what you can get from a court once you're in. The recognition of substantive law, of rules telling citizens how they should behave in ordinary life, has been a slow process. Indeed, it's still going on today. The courts and writers responsible for this process, most famously Blackstone, but continuing in recent times to writers like Burke's, They drew on many sources, moral theory, 
continental writers, civil law, and so forth. But their most important source was the existing law, and that law, as I said, was largely remedial law. The result was that substantive law has been derived to a significant extent from remedial law. And this process has left many marks on the common law, but the most general is that the common law has never fully separated substantive from remedial law. Common law lawyers continue to view substantive law through a remedial lens. This viewpoint explains why it's normal in many common law countries to begin contract law courses by studying remedies. It also explains why we shouldn't be surprised that it was a common law judge, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who famously defined a contractual obligation as a disjunctive obligation to perform or pay damages, and why an entire school of private law academics, the law and economics scholars, have built their careers around this definition. Now, in this lecture, I've argued that we need to move beyond this kind of reasoning. We need to take seriously the distinction between substantive and remedial law. I've also tried to suggest some of the questions that arise when we approach the law in this way, um, for example, the question of whether the law of damages is remedial or substantive, and I've tried to answer some of these questions. But ultimately, however, what matters is not my answers. What matters, in my view, is that the questions are asked. Thank you. Thank you.